Oh gosh, look at the crowd. Come this way. Those who spread goodness radiate happiness to everyone around them. Introducing LOLC Finance Credit Cards. Fuel the goodness in you. Welcome to LinkedIn TV. I'm Ashwini Vedakan. Joining us on this week's show is the former secretary to the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Rajiv Amarasuriya. Welcome to the show, Rajiv. It's good to have you here with us. At the firstly, thank you for the invitation. It's good to be on the show. As agitation escalated, a message widely circulating on social media claimed that military law prevented armed forces from shooting at demonstrators if they were carrying the national flag as this was a war crime. Does the flag protect or give added protection to protesters? Uh, one must be uh, mindful when relying on social media. Uh, sometimes it could be someone's misunderstanding of a situation and sometimes of course you have fake news intentionally introduced to mislead and misguide, misguide someone or a group of people. Now, personally, when I see something which I'm not sure whether it is true or false on social media and, and if, it, if it is relevant for some reason, I always take make the extra effort to just search it straight away from the, on, from the phone on Google and see whether it is true or false. And often, it is the first, the first on the search, the first item which comes up, may say it is fake news or it's in circulation. It was there several months before it's being circulated again. So one must, one must be mindful. Now, in respect to the flag, my understanding of the law is that there is nothing which gives one extra protection. By holding a national flag, that is not a reason why security forces personnel cannot shoot you. Now, one must be also appreciate that military personnel or police shooting at, a, at an unarmed civilian who is engaged uh, in a peaceful protest would be nothing less than murder. And that is important. Um, some have I have seen some of the posts, some speak of Geneva Conventions. Uh, we are not in a war situation for the Geneva Conventions to be applicable at present. Uh, and in this respect, also, the Constitution also has provision uh, in Article 14.1b which provides, that, uh, the, provides for the fundamental right for a peaceful assembly, uh, the freedom of peaceful assembly. So that is also well entrenched in our constitution. Uh, so unless there is something very violent, for instance, or where there is say incitement of uh, maybe racial or religious harmony, uh, one cannot use force. And therefore the prote protesters also have a responsibility if they are protesting to ensure that there is absolutely no violence there is no incitement of any other say, racial religious harmony or, or even breach of the peace. Uh, also, one must be mindful. Uh, those who don't want uh, these protests to happen could well also incite violence or perpetrate acts of violence to sab sabotage uh, these protests. And these are things which happen not only in Sri Lanka, but one may find even across the world. Um, now, now, one must one sees, I mean, I've seen this on social media and even, maybe even the newspapers, that there's an, there's an allegation made that that burning of the bus in Mirihana was not by any of the uh, legitimate protesters. Uh, we don't know the veracity of this, but it is up to the police, I would say, to find the perpetrator. Uh, the failure or maybe the delay by the police could also well draw the further inference, at least in the public domain, that it was not by, by, by any of the protesters. So this is, this, this is why I must also stress why the democratic institutions must be strengthened. That, that is, if we are all speaking of this change, systematic change, uh, we must also look at strengthening the democratic institutions. Um, we need a independent and strong uh, police, no doubt, if there are unlawful orders requested by the, on the police, Police officers must be strong enough without fear or favor to refuse unlawful orders. Uh, and the same uh, with other enforcement authorities as well. Uh, just last week, we saw some lawyers, uh, because it was not an organized protest in that way, but some lawyers had, uh, at least the, uh, some lawyers had surrounded the Attorney General's department and called for explanation uh, of, from the Attorney General of the withdrawal of cases. Now, there's a school of thought that this was not ethical and should not have happened, uh, be that as it may, but the fact remains. 
uh, that uh, there is a public perception, uh, maybe possibly misconceived to a great extent, uh, that the Attorney General's Department has played ball with, with successive governments in power. Now, uh, possibly this is, this is unfair to generalize it in this way. But having said that, uh, from time to time, we all have sometimes doubts that possibly could be due to the lack of information. Or, or on the other hand, it also could be conversely that there is that, that some of those doubts uh, are, are grounded in some basis. Uh, so no one in this respect, you know, we always speak of sovereignty in the people. No one is above the law and even the attorney general and the department must be transparent and the work must always be, always be in the uh, public and national interest. And there can be no excuse for any other, any other course. Uh, in this respect, even the courts, I feel, um, uh, courts, courts must be always independent. Um, also, there is a, another aspect. On this, courts must also be progressive and seek to resolve and solve national and public issues whenever possible. Uh, in my mind, courts anywhere in the world which are merely independent are not enough. We need to see speed justice, and if something is something wrong is being perpetrated, say even by the highest in the land, one must have confidence that the courts of law will not tell off any space. For such such activity, um, I think one reason for India to come where they have presently is because of the very proactive and progressive Supreme Court and High Courts they have. But but also one must be mindful. Um, see, in the best of democracies, have 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 had issues. If one remembers the uh, Supreme Court determination in the United States during the uh, election of President George W. Bush. The decision, if I recall, was on basically divided on party lines of uh, those judges who were appointed from the, by the respective uh, administrations. So, so what I want to stress is in this in this change which we are looking at and which is being talked of, we need to strengthen these democratic institutions. Uh, if we are to if we are actually to see the the benefits which uh, to benefits which we are all looking at. Uh, coming to the entire citizens, citizenry of this country. So is there room for a compromise in view of the standoff between our parliamentarians and the people? For example, a caretaker cabinet comprising of elected MPs and appointees from civil society and professionals using the national list. And then maybe a referendum asking people whether they want re-elections. Yes, this is certainly one uh, option available uh, to have a good uh, competent team in place, at least for the critical roles. Uh, when selecting or electing people, as we look at education and competencies, we need to also consider integrity of that individual concern. In addition, one needs to also look at whether the person concerned will always have the country's future at heart. And that uh, I think is essential because we have got here uh, without looking at those safeguards. Uh, uh, this is also not something easy to decipher. There are people who say, I love my country, I will do anything for my country. But if one drills down, sometimes you find that either the person is an excellent actor or good at deceiving some people. Sometimes you also, you might find that some uh, someone like that is maybe uh, dangerous. You find that such a person is a racist. You also not, not being uh, nationalistic. Uh, on your question on a referendum, a referendum is also ultimately an election and Sri Lanka cannot for the election at this juncture. Um, I personally believe uh, we need to address the immediate issue which I mentioned, which is the economic issue, and everything else uh, can be around it. Uh, but now it is uh, it has to be addressing the shortages of food, food medicines, and, and the non-essential parts of you know non-essential non activities uh, must, must have has, has to be put on the back burner. And that, that also includes maybe roads and highways. I think there was a public outcry when there was there were four ministers appointed and one of which was Minister of Highways. But that is not something we can afford to do at this at this juncture. Um, so uh, basically that that is that is that is what we need to look at. And on that note, we'll be going in for a short break. 
you love the feeling of being renewed. To stay beautiful every single day. To breathe just like we do because you are truly delicate. Protecting the ones who've been with us through the years with Sailac Care, the only wood coating that truly protects you. Sailac Wood Coatings from Jet. Welcome back to the show as we continue our conversation with the former secretary to the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Rajiv Amarasuria. Now Rajiv, during our last interview featuring the Bar Association President Salia Piris, he stated and we quote, further political instability will lead to economic instability as this is a vicious cycle. So what do you think is the next step for Sri Lanka? Yes, Sri Lanka, that's an important uh, question. Um, I like to at least call myself a pragmatist. Um, we need to look at our immediate priorities. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the BSL economic statement was issued on the 14th of January uh, earlier this year. Uh, it was circulated everywhere and every national newspaper, channel, TV channel carried it. And we raised our concerns in that statement. Uh, if the government or it's the various uh, functionaries understood and appreciated I'm, I'm constrained to say this, uh, appreciated uh, even one line of the two-page document, then they would not have acted in the way, I'm sorry to say this, but they would not have acted in the way they have in the last three months, because they just continued the way they have been uh, acting the way, the, the way they did the months before. Um, in fact, uh, a few days back on a TV interview, um, I said it was, uh, I'm again constrained to say this, but I think this is important to say and articulate. I said it was um, absolute arrogance on the part of the state and the relevant officials to ignore what everyone was saying. Now, my association was one, one, one body, but everyone at the time, December and January, was saying that we are headed towards a huge crisis in May, May sorry, in March, April, and May. And, and they continued the way they, they, they were without any uh, change, of course. Um, we must learn as a mature democracy to say as it is. Uh, sometimes the whole problem is people are afraid to speak out, thinking that they would um, upset the past that we. Uh, my view is a little different. Uh, by speaking out at the right time, uh, you're, stop, you're supporting, in my, my understanding, you're supporting the past that be to look at the other views and, if necessary, even correct direction. Um, often in Sri Lanka politics, um, leaders are surrounded by yes men. And then that is something not any particular leader that has been the case for now decades. Uh, they may be the most educated or leading in persons in their respective areas. Um, but I don't think apart from maybe a handful of people with absolute integrity, that many would say what they think, frankly, to leadership. At best, they might sugarcoat whatever to be said, and, 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 and by doing so, they miss the point, and then to that extent, those leaders also are now secluded from, from reality. Um, before we uh, look at, in response to your direct response to your question, before we look at long-term change, we need to get out of this grave economic issue. Um, and in my book, that is a responsibility of those who have got us into this issue. I have heard some saying that uh, they inherited all these issues and this was not their making. If they feel that way or if they felt that way, they should have not sought election and sought office. Now that all of them have sought election and come into power, the president downwards, they all have a responsibility to, in the first instance, take us out of this crisis. And this is also part of accountability. Not only being accountable for your actions, but also being accountable to take out or come out of, of, of or be responsible to come out of something we brought people into uh, to, to remedy the situation. Um, apart from the very serious uh, and grave security lapses we had 
uh, in the previous government was in 2019. There was a running, running country when this government took over. And uh, all those in government and agencies have a duty by this country to bring back this country to at least, I would say, what it was at the time they took it over, of course, subject and, and, and um, to the security issues before handing over the handing over uh, to anyone else to take take it further. Uh, we need we need a change, of course. Now we have a new governor of the central bank, and and that also credit must go solely to the people. This is a gentleman who could have would well have been appointed earlier, but for reasons best known to the government, they did not then. He went into retirement. When this government came into power in 2019. No one, even at the time, I don't think, entertained the thought of retaining Dr. Idrajit Kumar Swami as the governor. And, and he and obviously resigned, but he could have been asked to stay. But now he's a, he's, he has become one of our saviors. Um, I, I would like to maybe even look at him like a, st a statesman of maybe the caliber of uh, Lakshman Khadir Gama, helping us out in this difficult hour. Then uh, it was this government who appointed an academic of uh, relatively advanced age as the governor, when we knew that we were in difficult times and one needed someone at the time with energy and drive and maybe the ability to think out of the box and that was, that was missing. So there have been mistakes made continuously and therefore that can't, cannot be forgiven. Um, so for me, what needs to be done now, actually th this should have been done uh, not now, it should have been done maybe a week, a month, uh, three months ago, or even before that, to go before the IM, IMF and, and secure the best possible, best possible deal for Sri Lanka. Uh, for this, I don't think uh, you need uh, an economic savvy finance minister. All you need is someone who can listen to, uh, understand and appreciate the advice of experts and, and, and ensure that the best agreement is entered into between Sri Lanka and the IMF. Uh, Mr. Ali Sabri, uh, President's Council, who is now the Finance Minister, uh, I believe well fits this role um, as a leading lawyer, as someone who did a lot for the justice sector during this period. And I have confidence uh, that he will do his very best uh, to, to uh, arrive at the best possible agreement uh, for Sri Lanka. Actually, another option would be maybe to send someone like Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami to represent Sri Lanka at the IMF with full authority from Sri Lanka. And that, that's also another, another, another possibility. But uh, I think it is more than imperative that all our resources are directed to, to go to the IMF. We are, the IMF is just the beginning of change, but we need to get that done as soon as possible, irrespective of all this, all this, all what is what is presently uh, taking place. A final question for this evening, Rajiv. From a constitutional standpoint, is there scope to abolish the executive presidency, and how would this work? How long would the process take? Yes, Ashwini, there are uh, two schools of thought uh, presently: the opposition and many uh, rights act uh, activists uh, are calling for the abolition of the executive presidency. On the other hand, when 6.9 million uh, people of, of, of the population voted for President Rajapaksa, one of the areas of change was to make the exit presidency stronger. Uh, personally, I'm not convinced that, the, that abolishing the executive presidency would be a panacea to all our problems. Uh, I do appreciate that there have been um, time without number when holders of the office of president have abused the office. Or use the office to stifle dis dissent at times, at the times uh, maybe to stifle others, even 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 to to control the other branches of government, uh, to achieve uh, collateral purposes and uh, which are coloured by vested interests. Now, having said that, um, if as a uh, country we are going to come out of this um, situation we are in, uh, one might uh, even call it a rut, to to put the bond of a better word. Uh, we also need to look at a mechanism which we can have expeditious development. So the, the contrary view is that the executive presidency in the hands of a right benevolent leader would also be a huge strength to a, to a country in crisis or coming out of a crisis. 
this is especially in view of uh, the one may argue that a parliamentary system of government may not have the effectiveness of a strong presidency and that is also one of the reasons when it was introduced in 1977 or 78 um, but i fully appreciate the concerns raised uh, by many and they are legitimate a president must be president appointed by the people must be fully accountable to the people and there is absolutely no question about that uh, so to me, of course, we should look at, I think, something in between where we can have a presidency, uh, which can be a catalyst for speedy recovery of this country, the development we all look forward to, but also with the necessary checks and balances in place to ensure that there would not be situations of abuse of office. Um, now take, for example, the, the appointment of judges of the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal. Under the 19th Amendment, we had a more independent system of appointment with the Constitutional Council. And that was taken out by the 20th Amendment, making the Parliamentary Council, uh, which constituted of uh, members of Parliament, and giving, of course, through that process, more powers to the President. Now, appointment of judges should not have anything to do with development. A President cannot be heard to say, uh, I could not develop the country as there was an independent uh, process in place to appoint the best and most uh, competent judges. So these are areas which can be strengthened while it's also maintaining the, the, the powers of an effective president. The same applies to uh, several of those attributes of the 19th Amendment, including the, the independent uh, commissions we had. Uh, so we need a balance between these, these, these competing interests, uh, I feel, to achieve the best for our country. Now, on your direct, getting back to the direct question you asked me on the process of the process of abolishing the executive presidency. Um, ultimately, it is an amendment. It's a significant amendment to the constitution. Generally, to bring an amendment to the constitution, one would need a two-thirds majority of the members of parliament approving it to become law. But uh, of course, one must be mindful that any amendment. Uh, any basic amendment also can be challenged, any bill or part, bill can be challenged uh, before the Supreme Court on sp uh, certain specific uh, grounds. And that also, there's a process which can take up to a maximum of uh, three weeks. Also, if an amendment violates certain entrenched provisions in the Constitution, then in addition to the uh, special majority in Parliament, one must also uh, the, such such amendment would also require the approval of the people at a referendum. Uh, depending on how the, the changes are brought in, whether it requires a referendum will ultimately have to be determined by the Supreme Court. But a far-reaching amendment of the nature of taking away the executive presidency, abolishing the executive presidency, uh, my first reaction would be that one would require the approval of the people at a referendum, and of course, in addition to the special majority in parliament. Uh, there was a previous attempt, uh, Ashwini, in 2018, when I think I recall it was the JVP which introduced a uh, bill to amend the uh, constitution and abolish the executive presidency. Uh, and when the Supreme Court uh, looked at it uh, during special determination, in that determination, of course, the Supreme Court held that if one is taking away uh, the executive presidency, is also part of the franchise, which is found in section Article 3. And if one is taking away, uh, even though you're whittling it down, it's something which the people have decided to have. And if you're taking away that process, then one must, one must uh, also obtain the, the approval of the people uh, at a referendum. So, so ultimately, even a referendum is an election and would take time. And uh, the Constitution provides that uh, one must give at least one period of one month's time from the proclamation of a referendum. And of course, there are certain additional uh, guidelines uh, which have to be followed. Uh, we have to have the voters' lists in place. Uh, and also, the Elections Commission has a huge role to play. They will have to decide how much time they need to, to mobilize uh, uh, election, which is even a referendum, is, as I said, is an election. And of course, we have other issues. I don't think we have too much paper in the country. I have heard some, somebody was saying, I can't remember some interview, that even to print ballot papers, we don't have paper. Mm -hmm. So 
it, 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 it possibly will take time if you go down, if you have to go down the path of, of abolishing it in that way. Well, this has been a rather insightful conversation. Thank you for joining us this evening and for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Oh, thank you, Ashwini. It, it, was, it was my uh, pleasure uh, to be, be on the show. It's nice to be back after some time. And that's all the time we have for you this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching and stay safe.